Welcome to the Higher Ed Athletics Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Tim Duncan, Vice President of Athletics and Recreation at the University of New Orleans. So, Tim, thanks for being on the Higher Ed Athletics Podcast. Travis, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. Um, you know, I'm studying a lot in my doctoral program about um, urban universities, uh, urban research universities, and always looking to try and find those D1 institutions that are also in a pretty big city. And I, I graduated from one in IUPUI in Indianapolis, so I'm always focused on that. And you know, I want to kind of start with profiling the institution a bit. So for those that are not familiar with University of New Orleans, can you maybe just give some brief stats about the institution, what size or uh, location it is in New Orleans. And then from an athletic department side, maybe um, the conference, the number of sports and athletes that you all have. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for having me on. And just a, an aside based on your, I guess, research topic. This is my third urban in research institution. I worked at University of Memphis and Northeastern University prior to the University of New Orleans. So I do uh, enjoy working in cities that have urban research institutions. So it's a pleasure to be here at the University of New Orleans. We're about 50, I think we're in our 52nd year of athletics. So we're a very young institution, particularly compared to uh, some of the other institutions around South. Um, we are division one. Um, we've been that for a while. We have 14 sports. Um, we don't have football. I think that's probably most noticeable that we're uh, one AAA, so we don't have we don't sponsor football. We have 14 sports, about uh, 197 student athletes, uh, eight head coaches for those uh, 14 sports, and about 65 staff members. Our university's enrollment is about 8,400, um, so we're a medium-sized university. It used to be much larger um, back in the uh, prior to Katrina. But with the population shift of New Orleans and the growth of some other suburban uh, universities, um, our enrollment has uh, taken a dip, but most recently has grown three years in a row. So we're excited about this trend of uh, students refinding the University of New Orleans. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I noticed a recent rebrand. I'm not sure how recent, but um, of you kind of rebranding as NOLA's team, hashtag NOLA's team as part of the strategic plan. And, you know, that reminded me of Dr. Brandon Martin, who you may know, um, VP for athletics at uh, UMKC, where they rebranded themselves as Kansas City's college team on their website. And I thought that was uh, creative to try and, uh, you know, uh, just put the city out there. And, you know, a goal of the strategic plan I looked at is to, there's a lot of things there. So I encourage people to check it out and get some ideas on how to create theirs. But, you know, it was to strengthen the connection between UNO and the city of New Orleans. So just curious if you can walk me through some of the strategies you all will be using or are using to, to really strengthen that, strengthen that connection between your institution, your athletic department, and the city. Yeah, what most people don't know is I think we have seven four-year institutions in the city, uh, two lanes, another division one, and we have uh, four uh, NAI institutions. So it's a very crowded marketplace with, in, with LSU 90 minutes down the road, not even, they're about 90 miles down the road um, that you know, is such a dominant force in the state. And we also have the Saints and the Pelicans. So it's a crowded marketplace here. Um, and we wanted to own, um, we're the only ones in the college space that, uh, that have New Orleans across our chests. And that means a lot for us. So for us to uh, create uh, in conjunction with Kelvin, the NOLA's team brand, I think it made a lot of sense to show that we are um, the, the only uh, college program with the, with the city across our chest. So um, that helps us to build a connection with the city, which led to the, our strategic plan. In that process, we, um, we used a lot of the feedback from my initiative, 100 meetings in 100 days when I first arrived on campus. Um, we used feedback from there. We did some focus groups with season ticket holders, donors, faculty, staff, and students to uh, just get their insights on the city and uh, the program itself and how they interrelate. So uh, we did a lot of research to come up with this NOLA, NOLA's team um, hashtag and brand. And I think it allows us to connect. Um, we've, we led the country and community service, which was, uh, in my opinion, um, a direct effort to reconnect with the city. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for us to uh, volunteer, our student athletes to volunteer down here. We've done that. We led the country uh, in 1920. 
1920 with Helper Helper as documented by them. So it allows us to get out and meet everybody and they can meet our student athletes. And they're the stars of our programs, our student athletes and our coaches. So when people meet them, they uh, you know, become uh, invested in our characters. And then one other thing that we've done a number of things, but another key component of what we've done, what we've done besides Nola's team um, and community service is create our television show um, inside Nola's team which is about stories about our program. So it's not a highlight show or a coach's show, but it really delves into the characters that we have as student athletes um, here on our campus, student athletes and coaches and the stories around our program. So that uh, is our own regional television and with Comcast uh, sports. So that's another way that we try to connect not only with this uh, city, with our beautiful city, but with the region itself. Wow, that's a, I hadn't seen that. That's a, that's a great idea and an opportunity. You know, I, I thought back to your um, your 100 meetings and 100 days saying uh, from seeing it on Twitter and really ambitious and awesome. Now I think of, you know, the first thing people probably think of when you say you do that now, would be, that's a lot of hand sanitizer to go through <laughs> uh, once we're back. But right. it's, uh, what did you, I mean, what did you learn the, the best things about that, um, that process? Because a lot of people have a 100-day plan. They don't necessarily right. have a 100 meetings plan. Yeah, I think some people have done it. They just didn't uh, package it like ours. That was one of the things that Kelvin and I talked to before I even started here day one, is how can we package this effort so it can reach people? Again, we wanted to create some, uh, create a little noise in this crowded market space. So uh, we wanted to do that. And what we learned was that uh, University of New Orleans has a rich history of uh, particularly in, in a couple of signature sports and women's basketball by winning the NIT in the 80s. Men's uh, baseball by being the uh, first uh, college team in the state of Louisiana to go to the College World Series, and as well as men's basketball when they were ranked, had Tim Floyd, they had uh, guys like Urban Johnson who played in the NBA. Um, so we have a rich history that people had pride in that um, many of the younger generation had forgotten about. So that was instrumental. And we talked about everything from game times to you know, opponents, we schedule differently now than what, when, what they did before I got here because our fans wanted to see Division One home games in our building. So this year we're hosting our first tournament over Thanksgiving holiday, and we'll have some like uh, institutions that we'll be playing with that are Division One. So um, that feedback that I received during those first critical months was, uh, was, was invaluable, and we continue to build off of it today. And, you know, the things we've talked about the last several minutes uh, probably helps with this next question, because another goal is, it's just like everyone right now, especially right now, is to maximize revenue generation and philanthropic support. And I think this connection goes out saying, and then your meetings obviously drums up support. Um, authenticity is huge. It seems like with that intentionality, uh, what can you all do being there in New Orleans what are maybe some of the ways your team is going to try and reach these goals that maybe UNO hadn't tried before uh, to actually get revenue as well? Well, first, philanthropically, uh, we brought in Steve Stroud as deputy AD and chief uh, revenue and um, development officer. And he just had a great vision. We have a history of working together. We worked together at the University of Memphis at the start of my career. And he's, bound, he's uh, been at multiple institutions and has led development efforts um, you know, all around this country. So I was I was fortunate that he wanted to come and work with us and he set the tone as to what we wanted to do. And then um, so philanthropically, I mean, we had to start from the beginning. They had an annual fund before, but we rebranded it and repackaged it to the privateer scholarship fund and made that specifically for student athlete scholarships, which is how um, we've done annual funds before. So that's something that's new. Um, they didn't really have a major gift program, so we didn't have a ton of donors who consistently made major gifts to help with facility or programmatic needs. So we started that um, with the May Street Floyd Society. It's a major gift society that will allow us to you know, honor those two men and it gives uh, uh, allows us to ask for major gifts and utilize at the discretion that I see as a priority for the department. So we appreciate the the uh, supporters who have uh, have enough vision and will believe in in our vision to uh, support us in that manner. We partnered with Aspire um, to do outbound ticket sales. Most of the time when you ask people why they haven't come to a game, they hadn't thought about it or weren't asked. So 
we uh, repositioned a gentleman here, Vince Granito, who has a long history of success in the city and in um, athletics by working at Tulane for a number of years and working here prior to I received to I started here. Now he's a, our Aspire general manager, and he's done a fantastic job to have us meet our revenue goals during COVID. He just started this last summer. So and we met our revenue goals during COVID. So we are really bullish about this year with no restrictions on uh, social distancing or, or capacity. So Rick, those are a couple of things that we've done to try to increase the uh, revenue here. And I'll, the last thing is this year we created a signature event. Um, it's called Empower Her Private Privateers. And that's an effort that we are doing to help support our women student athletes with uh, scholarships, mentorships, and educational opportunities. And we were very fortunate to get Ms. Gail Benson, the uh, owner of the Saints and Pelicans, to be our very first speaker for that brunch that will be in, on August 27th. So that's exciting for us to get the iconic leader of, of, of this passionate fan base uh, and those two organizations to uh, speak at our brunch in support of uh, our women student athletes. So those are a few of the things that we've done, and we have much more in store uh, moving forward. Yeah, um, yeah, I've never been in New Orleans, but uh, I always like the Saints um, because of Drew Brees, except for um, when I was in college and in Indianapolis hosted the Super Bowl. He was there um, just to watch and he stayed at the I was a Bellman in the hotel. <laughs> and I, I drove him around the city because he didn't want to drive around in like a cab or a uh, Uber or anything like that or a town car. He just wanted to be normal. And uh, but uh, and then my um, Unfortunately, as a kid, he, you know, or I was in high school, he beat my Colts in the Super Bowl. So uh, <laughs> New Orleans, I was glad they got the, got a Super Bowl, especially after yeah. Katrina and everything. But I just wish it would have been against someone not the Indianapolis Colts. I get um, it. But but you know the there just seems like such an opportunity in that city, and um, you know, kind of ending it here with with strategic plans. Season three podcast, trying to get more tactical advice and. And a lot of people, if you haven't put a strategic plan together yet, they're going to be. And, and a lot of them probably have to modify it uh, incredibly um, if they did it right before COVID and, and now with NIL. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, whenever you think about your senior staff and what pieces you have around you on campus, how do you actually go around putting together who's going to be involved in that strategic plan? But then also how are you going to track the benchmarks of everything that you put in there? Cause you're only as yeah. knowledgeable about what you track. Yeah. Um, so first we, again, we talk to everybody. We talk to faculty staff, we talk to students, we talk to season ticket holders, to donors and to our athletic staff and coaches. And we wanted to get buy-in and we had pretty much uh, someone from every group in the department be involved in it because at the end of the day, it's not my strategic plan. It's our strategic plan. So they had to have, um, input, which creates buy-in. So they were able to do that. And so I, it was widespread. It wasn't something that we just created ourselves. And then as far as accountability, we've had two quarterly meetings where we talk and discuss what we've accomplished so far in the strategic plan. And we'll do that at our retreat next month to see what we've accomplished over the first year. It's not quite a year, but over the first year of our strategic plan. So each of the six goals is owned by either me or a member of my executive team, and they will take the time to discuss, okay, here's what we said we were gonna do, here's what we accomplished in year one. And we'll continue to do that quarterly for the next, um, I guess it's not 60 months, 48 months, to uh, make sure that we are doing what we say we're gonna do. It was important for us that, uh, I'm gonna use a cliche that Steve Stroud hates, that this wasn't a document that was just gonna stay on the shelf. It was a document that we that was a living document that we would leave, uh, that we would uh, utilize and track and hold ourselves accountable by reporting this information out not only to our our faculty uh, not only to our staff coaches and student athletes but we'll do that um, publicly as well we'll figure out how to uh, let people know where we where we stand against what we said we were going to do the um you know What's interesting that I've ever since I started my doctoral program, so I'm going into the second part of it, I, I put more emphasis on studying the institutions and not necessarily the athletic departments, mm -hmm. but you can kind of go down a rabbit hole um, when you do that. But I started paying attention to system governance and you know, I wasn't even aware that University of New Orleans is part of the University of Louisiana system, right. with eight other D1 schools, including Grambling State, McNeese State, Nickel State, Northwestern State, Southeastern Louisiana State. Louisiana Tech, and then UL Lafayette and UL Monroe. 
five of the nine are in the system uh, are part of the Southland Conference too, I believe. Right. And so, right. yeah, I th- I just want to ask: Is there any type of collaboration between the ads of those schools, either officially or through the system, or unofficially? And um, you know, maybe with COVID, for example, North Carolina system talked to several of the ads in that system, and and they started leaning on each other more with COVID protocols. And you all technically report to the same your presidents or your chancellors uh, are report to the same people. So I'm just curious if there is any type of collaboration. And if not, do you think there's a chance to? Yeah, it, it definitely is some collaboration. I'll give you, let me back up just a little bit. So I was AD of Clayton State for four years in Georgia and the University System of Georgia has 28 schools. So it was some collaboration there. They were a little bit more handsy than the University of Louisiana system. But here, yeah, there is collaboration. We talked through our COVID um, pro policies and procedures. We've talked through um, adding um, key phrases into contracts for coaches. So all the contracts have come from a similar template. So it, it covers um, you know, any sexual harassment or Title IX violations and things of that nature. And then most recently we worked together um, as a cohort to develop the University of Louisiana system, University of Louisiana system um, NIL policies. So, yeah, there's quite a bit of collaboration. I think it'll only grow from here. It's great working with those colleagues. Um, The University of New Orleans was in the LSU system from its uh, beginning through maybe 2012, I believe. So, um, and the the administration thought the University of Louisiana system would be a better fit for us, and so far it has been. So I appreciate working with Dr. John Henderson. He's the president of the system and his staff as well as my colleagues at the eight other institutions. Yeah, and um, I noticed that too, and I'll bring it up a little bit, uh, a little bit about the LSU system, because I thought that was interesting too. And, you know, another thing about UNO is I think it's the only institution in the system that does not offer football, right? It is. So my question with that is, do you think that gives you all somewhat of an advantage just to be different in athletics and in any way of the system? Or maybe less. Um, I don't think it's an advantage because we're in Louisiana. <laughs> this is a football state for sure. So I think um, it makes us a little bit more nimble. It made us uh, not so reliant. When COVID was threatening to end football, um, the other eight schools had a lot more invested in football. So a lot more of their expenses as well as their revenue was uh, determined by football. So they would still have all of the expenses and potentially zero of the revenue. So that was a little bit scary for all of us, but particularly for them. So it makes us a little bit more nimble. Um, I think that um, football obviously is a is, is the passion in not only in America, but specifically in the Southeast where we are. So I think we would probably have a little bit more notoriety if we had a successful football program. But those things are so expensive to start these days and we don't have it. So I think it allows us to, again, be more nimble and allows us to be creative and see how we can promote the sports that we do have to the fan base that's here in New Orleans. Yeah, I've um, I spoke to another AD um, recently and uh, talked about the Pioneer League for football and how for Mm -hmm. um, it was Davidson college, uh, mm-hmm. Chris Clooney and, yep. and how that's actually an advantage for an institution because you're getting the tuition revenue. But, um, you know, I've thought about this, that system schools, uh, that maybe had a large player in it. So whenever you all, your institution a long time ago was with LSU, I don't think anyone uh, on the board, uh, with LSU would, uh, would allow another school in the city that started mm-hmm. a football program. So, um, but yeah, it's, I can see how maybe not as advantage, but you also had that uh, not as much risk involved, uh, from the past fall, as you mentioned, you know, you have a direct report to president John Nicolo, um, being new to the institution at the start of the pandemic. And, and obviously during social unrest after the murder of George Floyd and, you know, with athletics, just in general, being such a public facing display, uh, for everywhere, but also UNO, I'm interested in hearing how with both of those situations and really just ever since you've been there, Um, You were both communicating your offices during the decision making uh, for the athletic department and the institution. Yeah, well, first, let me say that Dr. Niccolo is a primary reason for me attending here. Um, When the search firm reached out to me, the first the only thing they said in our first phone call was, Tim, there's an opportunity at the University of New Orleans. I want you to do your research on the president and we'll talk again in a few days. Literally, that was it. 
So that, that piqued my interest because that's not normally how search firms uh, communicate. So I did, and I was pleased to find that he's a former student athlete, a football student at Bucknell. His wife played volleyball there. Um, he's been progressive as far as uh, he's an engineer by trade, but he's been provost, worked a number of years at Arizona State and Southern Illinois before coming to University of New Orleans. And one of the things that I read about him that piqued my interest the most doing my research is when he was the provost and the, and the president stepped down and he was one of the candidates. And one of the students, I read a quote from one of the students that he actually comes out and talks to us. And that's the kind of leadership that I try to display by leadership by walking around and talking to student athletes and coaches and, and things of that nature. And that is absolutely, I found that to be a true statement. So for him to, um, you know, to be the leader here to me is a blessing for us uh, in our department. Um, and then, so I was here about eight or nine months prior to COVID starting. So we had a chance to build a solid foundation of a relationship. So uh, we work together and we don't want to do anything that, um, is out of alignment with the university. So we worked very closely together on COVID uh, and what we needed to do. The presidents in the UL system met multiple times. The athletic directors met and he and I meet regularly. And then we text and talk uh, almost daily. So that relationship is solid. And then we moved into some of the social unrest. Um, there are some things that I wanted to do. I wanted to talk to our African-American student athletes separately to give them a safe space to talk about their feelings with George Floyd. I had been stopped by police and I wanted to, them to be able to, rack, um, to talk to that. And then I brought all of our student athletes, coaches and staff together and had the same conversation from one day to the next. And I, I ran all that by him first and he was all about it. He thought that, yes, Tim, let's do it. He thought it was a wonderful idea. Uh, he embraced me uh, sharing my experience with our student athletes and coaches and ultimately with the alumni magazine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he he and I have a really strong relationship. Um, he was a, a man of supporter when we started Privateers for Equality, which is our social justice group. We've since kind of changed what that looks like now. It is going to be even better and more diverse than just social justice. But he is um, I, I try to make sure that he's never surprised by anything that we do. And fortunately, he's. Um, accepted my recommendation for many things that we do and the things that we don't I understand and maybe do with the timing or finances or whatever but it's never um we never we don't ever disagree because uh a difference in philosophy it's only about timing or money and those are temporary things that we can change so um those are you know uh, that's how we got through kind of to the, those two major crises uh in our country yeah and I think um you know from my experience talking to I've had uh, three college presidents on the podcast from Coastal Carolina, Southern Utah, and Indiana State, and they're all about the same size institution. Just so a, one's the same size as New Orleans, and the other ones are just a couple thousand students more. And mm -hmm. the one thing I realized is they seem to be able to. There's a lot going on if you have a med school uh, and stuff of that, and that that you can kind of have even not that people have a bad relationship um, with their athletic director and president, but. You, it's more intentional and I think you have more time to develop a relationship. And so um, that's glad to glad to hear that it's the same way there at UNL. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I know from Twitter and, and keeping pace with the news, in the industry that, um, that about the privateers for equality program. And yeah, I, you know, one interesting fact that I read about, you know, we talked about how it used to be part of the LSU system is that um, New Orleans, it was called LSU you know, um, but it was the first integrated publicly higher education institution in the, the South. Um, right. And I thought that was interesting. I'm curious, uh, what what about the privateers for equality? What kind of starting with that and what you have vision for it to right. kind of move the needle on on the topics that are you're most passionate about with your department? Yeah, New Orleans is one of the most diverse cities in the country. So the fact that um, at the time LSUNO started at, was founded. Um, as a diverse institution that was um, integrated is, I think, emblematic of what our city is. So that's something that's really special. But so privateers for equality was something that, you know, came out of conversations that I had with student athletes that we wanted to do something to support their um, interest in social justice and promoting that for the country. And, and it, it went well the first year. Our student athletes grew so much. Um, they got a chance to visit 
have some speakers visit. They did a get out to vote rally that was nonpartisan. Um, so there was some really great progress. But we thought that privateers for equality could be more than just about social uh, justice. So we elevated that to be an umbrella organization. And now social justice uh, committee is called Rise for Justice. And then we have other committees under that. So we have definitions not applicable, which is our, it's our LGBTQIA plus group. We have uh, Empower Her Privateers, which is the group that supports our women student athletes. And then finally, we have Privateer International to support our international students. So we look at Privateers for Equality as an umbrella organization for those four prongs. And that provides us with much better coverage um, for all of our student body, because we don't want to just um, promote the uh, needs of one group or the other. We wanted to provide um, an outlet for all of our student athletes. And each one of our student athletes can fit into one of those bodies. Um, so we're really excited about that moving forward. And uh, the Social Justice Committee was uh, gracious enough to allow us to utilize that great name, Privateers for Equality, to stand for the departmental needs and not just their needs. So we're pretty excited about that and look forward to uh, those groups getting uh, off the ground this fall. Well, the umbrella approach is kind of new to me um, that I've seen, but uh, it makes sense, right? Because you're, as you're, your student athletes are going to come and they're going to grad, they're going to compete, they're going to graduate, you're going to have new ones. And I mean, I'm, I'm only 32, but I know that the, the athletes I was friends with when I was in college, they didn't speak their mind as much and share their passions as much as today's student athletes. And it's a great thing to see evolve. And your umbrella, I mean, it could just could become a bigger umbrella uh, as more people come up with uh, different passion projects. And, you know, in, in the regular student body, you have, uh, you know, registered student organizations. And we have obviously have SAC and athletics. But this just seems like a great way to uh, – to really attract student athletes and, and let them kind of be passionate about different topics. Is that kind of what your thought process is for the future? Yeah, absolutely. And we have so many diverse student groups on campus. So now we start to mirror our campus more, which mirrors our city more. So I think it better serves all student athletes and, uh, you know, being a, a person of color, you know, I want to definitely make sure that we support our students of color, but that's not the only group. I want to be a great leader to every one of our students, whether they, um, regardless of who they love, regardless of where they look like or where they're from, where they where they are from or what their gender is, that's important for me to be a strong leader for all of them. So um, it evolved pretty naturally to that umbrella organization. And again, I'm super, super excited about about what that can do for our department and our university and city. Well, I want to you kind of alluded to this earlier as we wrap up um, towards the end of this is that you uh, there's always this interesting take on how people got to where they are and uh, especially within d1 getting to that ad chair it's what a lot of people like to talk about i do like to study it it's uh this year has been very interesting with a lot of turnover and right. people uh you know we've seen uh sydney athletic directors uh go to a power five to be a deputy position we've seen just so many different types of scenarios you know i was fortunate to spend three years as an assistant ad at a d2 powerhouse university of indianapolis working for uh you know the legendary sue willie Right. And you were the AD, as you mentioned, uh, at Clayton State and then Payne College earlier in your career. And so I'm curious, can you talk to me about what is both different and similar in leading a D2 athletic department, which those are diverse to, like, they're different right. sizes, but versus a D1 athletic department? Because I think some people think that you got to label yourself your entire career, but uh, you can, what are, what are some of the similarities and differences from someone that's been there at both spots? Yeah, the similarities are you're there to support student athletes and coaches. And, you know, I play, I'll make a football analogy, but I look at the athletic director position. If we um, compare it to football, it's not, I'm, I'm, I don't look at the quarterback. I look at myself as an offensive alignment to clear holes for the student athlete and coaches who are the quarterbacks and running backs and the skill position receivers. My job is to clear the way for them. So being in Division II, you're doing the same thing. You're just doing it with fewer resources, usually. Um, you know, there are some like uh, there are some division twos that have a, a larger budget than we do. But um, usually it's with, on average, uh, fewer resources. So that is the mission. Um, so that's the same. The difference is, uh, I think, not just, you know, financial, um, but sense of urgency was what I, I needed to get 
to come to Division One. So but when I left Clayton State, I went to Northeastern and worked for Jeff Coney, the AD and a longtime friend there. He is nothing if not uh, has a sense of urgency. So um, he taught me how to ratchet it up and get things done in a lot quicker fashion than I would have been before. And while I still um, am very thoughtful about what we need to do, um, there is a sense of urgency that you cannot replicate in Division Two that exists in Division One. And then just a level of competitiveness and, and um, you know, the notice and notoriety that the programs have um, is, is a lot different than Division Two as well. But I appreciate and embrace my time with Division Two. I learned so much. I learned how to be an athletic director there. I learned that my style of um, personal relationships, uh, accessibility with our student athletes, coaches and staff, that's where I was able to hone that. And the only thing that was that I was hesitant about coming to Division One is I didn't know if I could manage that same way. But it gave me the confidence to know that that's who I am and that's what I was going to do. And fortunately for me, the uh, the folks here in New Orleans have embraced that leadership style, and I think we're starting to flourish because of it. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you what you learned because, uh, um, you know, just knowing a lot of people in D2, it's a lot of people don't leave because they like the job so much. They yeah. stay and they enjoy it. And um, yeah, I, I had another AD on recently, um, Tom Berman from Wyoming, and, and he left Wyoming to go be an AD at Portland State and then came back. And I asked him if you um, did that, learning how to be an AD basically before he got to Wyoming was critically important. And so uh, you getting those experiences, even if they were a D2, you got a chance to learn how to become an athletic director and have successes. But you also probably learned some lessons, right, about uh, maybe what not to do and or maybe we'll make that mistake again. Try something different. Yeah. Uh, you agree? Yeah. When you're when you're an AD for the first time, there is uh, this you may have to censor this, but there's always an oh shit moment. So when you get in that chair, you can be like, oh shit, what the hell am I supposed to do now? And that's going to happen. So I, for me, it happened at Payne College, a, a school with 900 to 1,000 students that allowed me to learn. You're always going to learn different things, but I learned the job and what it meant to have a job that people look toward leadership and um, that type of thing. So um, to be able to do that in a less, the less pressure situation was great for me. Some people go from deputy at Alabama to AD at Akron, whatever. Um, uh, you know, FCS or uh, uh, a group of five university. And, and, you know, that's fine too. Everyone's path is different, but I'm glad that I was able to, uh, because I hadn't, and I worked in corporate for a long time. So I didn't have a ton of college athletic experience. By the time I became AD for the first time, I'd only been in the business for four years when I became AD. Um, so it allowed me to transition a little bit more smoothly um, because of that lack of experience in Division Two, than it would have been if I'd gone directly to Division One. Well, Tim, the the last thing I'd like to do is just uh, you know you you speak a lot at public forums, and and I appreciate you being on the podcast, and um, hopefully I threw some curveballs. You had to think, uh, get different questions, but you know I do like to end it now on advice and uh, for whatever route you want to take it. But the, the primary listeners here, are senior level administrators in college athletics, uh, early or mid to senior level, um, maybe some career on after COVID when our maybe, um, jobs start opening up again and, and just thinking about their own careers, what would maybe you give advice, either caution, um, about choices or, um, uh, practicality of any type of advice? Um, well, first of all, for, thank you for asking me on here again, and, and, and you really made me think on some of the questions. So I appreciate uh, not just the same run of the mill uh, questions that you're asked sometimes. So I appreciate that. But um, as far as advice to uh, senior level administrators, I think the interview is a two way process and you're interviewing your boss as much as they're interviewing you. And I think that's so, so critical. And it's at some point. I don't think that people should rush into a job if it's not the right boss. You want to understand it. What are the what are the people who left? Where are they going? And what are they doing? With, what are they doing with their careers? And I think that's critically important. And, and specifically, my last two jobs as deputy at Northeastern as and as AD here, I did as much research on those positions and got to know those uh, leaders. Um, as well as I knew myself, because I knew that was going to be the critical part of the relationship. And 
I, I would advise that, you know, not all jobs are created equal and that can be power five jobs with, you know, someone who doesn't have a history of, of advancing the people that work for him, him or her, or it can be a group of five or FCS or one triple A like us that has, you know, dynamic leadership that everyone you see um, is being promoted out of there. So that's important. Uh, it's important that Dana Freeman Patton, my deputy and CEO who was here, got an AD job, her first AD job at Cal State Dominguez Hills, a, a division two in California. She wanted to be an athletic director. I told her if she came to work with me, I'd do everything in my power to help her become one. And I had less to do with it than her, uh, obviously, but I'd like to think that I had a little bit to do with it. And I'm super excited that she got a chance to live and reach her goals. And I was a small part of that. And I want that for everyone in my department, whether that's to be head men's basketball coach at Kentucky, um, head track coach at USC, or, you know, that next athletic director at the University of Georgia. If that's their goal, then I'm going to do everything in my power to expose them the opportunities, hold them accountable enough so they feel some growth and then, um, you know, help introduce them to the right folks and have them polished enough so when they get the opportunity, they'll knock it out of the park. So that's the second reason why I do this job, the first one is to impact our student athletes. And the second one is to help uh, change lives through, you know, the families of the people that I work with. Tim Duncan, Vice President of Athletics and Recreation at University of New Orleans. I appreciate you being on the Higher Ed Athletics Podcast. Thank you, Travis. I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you.